Hi, I'm Will Webb, and this is Why You Should Watch. In this episode, we're discussing Baz Luhrmann's 1992 film, Strictly Ballroom. Samba! He had the world at his feet. Come on, number 100! He had the moves. Flashy, crowd-pleasing steps. He had the magic. I keep asking myself why. Did I fail in this <laughs> He had the music. The Pogo Pogo. Rudy Rumba. Tango, please. The one thing he needed was a partner. Stay calm, Liz. Stay calm. Piss off, Liz. I'm not dancing with you till you dance like you're supposed to. In this camp comedy, ballroom dancer Scott Hastings runs afoul of the oppressive Australian dance scene with his non-regulation steps. When his partner ditches him, ugly duckling Fran steps up, introducing Scott to a whole new form of dance. Joining me for this conversation is Sid Hever, who brings his wide experience as a producer, writer and director to our discussion. Hi Sid, how are you doing? I'm all right, thanks. How about you? I'm so well. So good to have (laughs) sat down here uh, and to have this conversation with you about a film that we both uh, really love. Uh, And it's a Mm. film that I haven't thought about in a while as well. Um, I'm interested to hear about kind of how you came to it but I think we should kick off by talking about how we met each other Sid produced a film for me um Sid produced a film with me I think that's a better way of saying it Sid produced a film with me called Dolstonian it was uh, my first funded short uh, and we kind of got together through uh Shooting People which is like a film recruitment website I actually don't know really what Shooting People is for to be honest as far as I understand but um you know (laughs) it it changes and I think uh but yeah it's a place where you can meet fellow filmmakers, but at every level, I think that's a good way of putting it. I think that, you know, it could be a mixture of people starting out or um, more experienced people or a mixture of, or kind of the other week I had a lot, uh, quite an in-depth conversation with, you know, random people about 16 mil, you know, cause I was just posted a question about, I'm thinking about doing a film, uh, shooting on film at some point and I, I was like I've got very li- limited knowledge can anyone just kind of give me some advice on it and you know at least like seven or eight people um just gave me feedback and advice and that was great <laughs> and I've you know I've noted it all down <laughs> I was like it's gonna take me a while it's not anything I'm gonna do right now because obviously I've got research it but um I was like but that's just the beauty of sites like that I think where you can connect with anyone and everyone um yeah it's like it's a film networking website and i suppose it has the the worst sort of aspect of any public networking website which is that the loudest voices are the least informed and um it means that i found that when i put stuff out i do get there's quite a lot of good people lurking on shooting people i think Mm. Um, but a lot of the conversations are like i've written a really bad film um (laughs) because i'm having a midlife crisis and i want someone else to pay to make it why won't they yeah stuff. and then, and then um, moaning yeah. about why yeah and then no one comments on it either <laughs> and also lots of stuff about like i've put my film on amazon prime my feature film that i self-funded and has no one of any like stature in it and no one's watching it why am i not getting the millions that i was promised in yeah. my 90s screenwriting book no but i think that's another thing that actually just by thinking about it that i think that just at the end of the day even like netflix amazon disney plus they are just platforms and i say that you know just platforms but just because you're on a platform doesn't mean you're automatically going to get success people still got to find you still got to market your film and obviously netflix and anything of that stature they're going to put their money into their own products you know or their own uh output you know essentially and even then you know it's all about algorithms as well so even there's, there's you know there's god knows how many projects on netflix for example but then you realize you're kind of only given a certain amount you know as part of your your homepage. yeah totally i actually think that's a long form problem for netflix because it mm. leads to the assumption most people i talk to say stuff like there's nothing new on netflix you know and they actually have a huge back catalog but the yeah. problem is, is that that algorithm presents you with the same 20 movies every time so exactly it, yeah it's a bit of a problem yeah and I've got, i should say as well that sid isn't just a producer but also a writer and director uh, and has directed a number of shorts over the last couple of years uh, as well as a documentary feature that's currently available to watch um, free on Plex, which is a streaming service in the UK, uh, an ad-supported one. And then there's also uh, several premium video on demand services that you can buy it through as well. So we'll whack up some links for those later on. Thank you. And I think it's probably a good time for us to talk about your pick for a movie that people should watch. Yes. Um, and it's an interesting one. It's the 1992 Baz Luhrmann debut film, Strictly Ballroom. Well, there'd been some silliness in the past, but we thought it was over it. 
I mean, we never imagined that he would do such a thing in front of... Federation the President, President, very fine! Yeah. And don't forget that the official Federation video, Yes, the Only Way to Dance... Wonderful to see you, Barry. Barry Pipes, dance to win his on sale here tonight! Yeah! So to give it a bit of context, this is a movie that was like a debut film. Uh, it was a pretty high budget. I think it cost about three million film for uh, mm. somebody who's a first time director. Baz Luhrmann had done quite a lot of work in theatre at that point. And in fact, this was developed out of a play. He'd uh, improvised originally with his like theatre troupe and then put together. Some actors from the original stage performances are in the film. Fran, notably, is, is um, from the original stage production. And it's also the first of uh, the so-called Red Curtain movies, which counts Romeo and Juliet and Moulin Rouge with it as well. Um, I call them Red Curtain, like their own trilogy, but really like all of his movies are basically part of that. They all have these Mm. shared stylistic approaches uh, to do with glamour and kitsch in lots of interesting ways that we'll talk about, I'm sure, as we go through. Um, But I remember this being a really striking thing for me as a teen because I'd never seen something that had that level of kind of artifice in it. This comes across... Uh, so strongly from that first moment where you see these red curtains that part to, mm. to kind of this big musical sting. So let's start with how you came to the movie. Sid, when when did you originally watch this? How did you find out about the film? That's a good question. I actually can't remember. I think it must have been, I don't remember the exact first time I watched it. I've got a feeling, <laughs> uh, I've got, I think it's possibly that I could have been watching it with my mum and dad at some point. Because I think, I think, I think there's also like the like I don't think it's like the holy trinity of Australian comedies that kind of broke through that time of you've got Strictly Ballroom, Mural's Wedding, and Priscilla the Queen of the Desert because they seem to definitely all of a similar time period they definitely crossed over I think definitely to maybe a UK audience but yeah, I think in fact, I, they actually yeah. have a name uh, it's called Glitter oh. Cinema as well oh, really? as Tent- oh, as or oh. Glitter Cycle so there's this Australian new wave film movement that I actually just did a video about for Little White Lies uh, and then long term that stuff develops into kind of a scene that can then support a second kind of set of those movies oh, really? which oh, are these kind of often quite lgbt focused or like kind of courting like a, a kind of kitsch fan base um, yeah. and so yeah it, it's it is literally strictly ballroom slash moulin rouge and then um mural's wedding and priscilla are kind of like the absolute key ones there's a number yeah. of much more like if you ask an australian they would mention quite a few more yeah, um, yeah. but those are the ones that kind of crossed over yeah 100 percent. so but i think i don't remember watching it until i must have been late teens as you like same as you um i don't remember watching it as a kid or anything. it was quite a, i think like quite late to watching it but i can't remember exactly when i watched it but and I, it's also interesting i wonder if i did enjoy it as much the first time i watched it like i, I definitely obviously i didn't hate or anything because I love the film but I'm trying to wonder if it was one of those films where I watched it once enjoyed it but I didn't kind of fully appreciate it until maybe multiple times or a second time watching it but I'm pretty sure it would have been the first time because I think it's it's a it's a satire essentially which I think that's that's just basically what I love um comedy obviously but uh, you know also quite a heartfelt film um but I think just I think it's a satire element of it I think that that's what I really connect to straight away and that's definitely my type of film and actually i really like australian comedies to be fair <laughs> yeah yeah, um, yeah there's a reason yeah. why they did so well at that period exactly yeah 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 definitely um and, so, and yeah, it's interesting I, yeah. I mean i think if you think about what was happening in uk cinema at the time you had films like train spotting and human traffic mm. that were in different ways but um covering kind of similar subject matter sometimes albeit darker ones yeah they were using a lot of stylistic experimentation i think yeah. it was to do with things like the role of music videos at the time and advertising. I certainly think of Lerman as being someone who almost subconsciously is creating advertising industry the whole time. It's yeah, notable yeah. that um, the, one of the most famous shots of Strictly Ballroom revolves around a Coca-Cola sign. Mm. And they, it's like they really fought to have in the film. They had to yeah. pay off Coca-Cola, I think, to use the sign. I think they gave the... I don't know if Coca-Cola gave them a little bit of money. I don't... But it doesn't make sense, or at least... But that wouldn't make... Oh, I don't know if that would make sense, but it would make, it would make more sense for the filmmakers to pay Coca-Cola to have it included, especially as like yeah. a first-time filmmaker in the early 90s. <laughs> like, we don't need this. Yeah. <laughs> he did direct the most expensive advert ever, still. Um, oh, which really? yeah, is, uh, it's number five, the film for Chanel, which has a Guinness uh, world record for the highest budget for an advertising commercial ever produced, uh, widely considered to have created kind of modern, um, like, I guess, perfume advertising it has Nicole yeah. Kidman in it, uh, who was of in course. Australia as well. So <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Uh, sorry, I meant the film Australia, not the place. Yeah, yeah. To be clear there. Uh, I remember well, like, Moulin Rouge, obviously, which started and then went to Australia. Yeah, yeah. This film came out when uh, I was. It was the year I was born, 1992. Um, so I definitely didn't see it in the cinemas, and certainly didn't have a strong yeah. contextual remembering of that. I don't think I saw it on VHS either. If I remember correctly, this is a film that did really well on DVD. Yeah. And I think it kind of coincided with the interest that happened in Moulin Rouge. So Moulin Rouge came okay. out in 2001, and I think there was a resurgence of interest in Street Ballroom as a result of that. Interesting, okay. I also remember it being a film that played a lot on uh, Film 4, which became mm. free to air when we were about 15. So that would have probably been it. Yeah, I've, yeah, I definitely saw it on TV before I bought the DVD, and uh, and that's still probably the best way I would watch it. Because, um, yeah, we can talk about <laughs> on stream platforms as well, like if it does, does it look different to you? Nope. Uh, so I'm interested to, to have a conversation with you about oh. that for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so me, the, I guess my, um, the next thing we should do is kind of talk about what the film looks like, what it's about, um, mm. what, it, what it kind of covers. You mentioned it's a satire um, and it's certainly like it's a, it tells a very heightened story. Um, it's yeah. interesting that you mentioned that it's also quite an emotional film. And mm. I think interestingly, those things are kind of linked. So yeah. to me, it, it kind of kicks off in this incredibly sort of dreamlike introduction sequence yeah. that's got these parting red curtains. Everything is as, as colorful, as saturated as possible. And it does lots of weird stuff with like, the camera is almost always filtered so that light points are kind of, mm. and they have cross flares on them, which are like lines going horizontally and vertically off them, like a, like a 70s music video or something like that. Lots of um, silhouettes as well, which again, that's something yeah. I love. <laughs> so yeah. from that first frame, I was like, yes. <laughs> so the, yeah, it's interesting. The first shot is uh, two people dancing in silhouette. And then once they've come through, they move past the camera into this real space. They're front lit with a very hot spotlight. So they're almost mm. overexposed by a pale light. Uh, and then just about a voiceover starts to come in and we start to cut to something else. But they freeze frame. There's a still frame and then it fades mm. through to another shot of them dancing. So it's quite collage-like. And there's also a lot of um, what's called step printing in this sequence, something that, that Lerman uses a lot, which is kind of artificially created slow motion. So it's when they take, instead of shooting stuff in slow motion, you print the frames for longer than they're supposed to be on screen. That's how you used to do it in film. Oh, right. Um, and so that's when you get that kind of stuttered, moving from frame to frame kind of stuff that's done. When, uh, For instance, when he starts doing these like outrageous moves, at the start, uh, that's often step printed. Right, okay. Um, and it's interesting because it is intentional. There's actual slow motion in the film as well. So you have to assume it's like a stylistic yeah. choice. And likewise, Moulin Rouge has quite a lot of step printing in it. So I think it's the kind of thing that he's interested in. Yeah, definitely. And that's what I like about it. Yeah, I like I like, I like the experimentation, especially even in just the opening sequence. Well, even the, maybe in the, the first opening 10, 15 minutes, there's so many different styles going on for sure. It's a huge, like, it's like a really strong thesis statement for not mm. only for the film, but for Lerman's filmmaking overall. Yeah. I think like, if you wanted to say to someone, you know, I wonder if you'll like Baz Lerman, you could show them the first 10 minutes of Strictly Ballroom and they would know. Uh, they, yeah. They've kind of got it. Um, and even yeah. down to like, there's a lot of very wide angle lenses kind of pushing in and out onto people. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and all that that kind of colorization as well. A lot of close ups as well. That's what I can. That's actually something I when I rewatched it again. Even though I kind of knew that because I especially remember just very a lot of the film is quite close. The more I think about it, you know. Yeah. When I watched there's it a and, sequence when he's dancing with someone else while the guy's like tersely telling him something, yeah. and it's shot in reverse over the shoulder shot. Mm. So the majority yeah, of the yeah. camera frame, it's really wide lenses. The majority of the frame is taken up by the back of someone's head and their shoulders. And then in a far distance, you know, relative to the camera, there's a guy's head and he's the person who's talking. And the yeah. whole sequence is shot like that, which is really weird filmmaking. It's quite unsettling and horror-esque in a way, but obviously yeah. in, in, but presented in a comedic way. But again, horror and comedy are naturally... Yeah. They, they go together as well, you know. They... It weirdly reminds me of Peter Jackson, who, of course, is making his name at the same time. Mm. And a lot of his early films have that really wide lenses pushing in. I think they share some cast members as well. Probably do. Probably, um, yeah. Between their movies. Um, and something that really struck me here that I'd forgotten completely about the film is that there's a whole section of, like, mockumentary yeah. stuff happening here. And that opening sequence, uh, his family members and people who are in the dance studio with him all kind of narrate this yeah. supposedly horrific dancing sequence yeah. in, yeah. in uh, past tense. Yeah. And it's shot again, like in a really stylized way, but in a much less um, over the top way, I guess it's not yeah. as like, it's much more grounded. It's still in these big wide lenses. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And, and then they move into the studio and the film kind of kicks off. Um, so yeah, it, it's this really like kind of, uh, it really sets out the tone for how the rest of the movie is going to happen. I think. Yeah. It's such a mix of though as well, like especially because then they it's a, 
I was wondering when I first watched it as well that I, d I don't know if you kind of maybe for the first 10 minutes or at least with that opening sequence of the actual tournament where you know Scott reveals he's in a dancer and he's uh his individual individuality um but also with the kind of documentary and it's interesting you say mockumentary because i wasn't sure i read this the other day and i was like i wouldn't know if i had class it as a mockumentary no then... i i mean they're mockumentary elements oh, yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah, definitely yeah. not as a film no, it's not a oh no yeah, yeah okay yeah. Cool. yeah same um but the documentary elements is obviously suggesting maybe truth or reality whereas you've got that that kind of you know real nature of it um but combined with the very uh you know close-ups of arse shaking and you know and all that yeah. and uh, and dancing and and piss off uh, <laughs> um all those kind of elements so you're like what so i think if you're watching for the first time you might go what am i watching you know yeah. so i think there's such a, a a kind of very contrasting um styles trying to battle it out and you're like where is this going and then they drop the kind of documentary element and but although when i rewatch it they still have the title um, cards yeah. for the tryouts, which I'd forgotten about. Um, which I think they have a title card for Pan Pacifico at the end as well. Oh, did they? Okay, so that yeah. was interesting. I, 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 I went in when I rewatched it. I was maybe all oh, the documentaries kind of dropped after about ten minutes, and as soon as you get back to the studio, even though it establishes like three days later. Um, and again, I never, and I always kind of, oh, what well, I don't know when I'm watching it, I kind of remember it then forget it, and I never question why you never see the documentary element again. Yeah. I think that's a quite a good balance. There was a. Um, yeah title like a title card suggests the tryouts which i'd forgotten about because i thought they'd kind of dropped it from that point so that it's kind of does make you question like is is that still meant to be like this documentary crew that are filming this you know journey you know like are they still part of it like what are they making that what kind of film are they making <laughs> that for me is the, the the reason why i don't think of it as a mockumentary because i think although yeah. there are like two camera sections where people talk as if there is a crew there and they have a title on screen like in a documentary yeah, yeah, yeah there's no point in that where you're supposed to think it's being filmed by people mm. i don't think there's any pretense about there being an actual documentary crew no. so yeah. it's like when you're watching say like amanda inucci stuff like the thick of it where it's yeah. shot like a documentary, but there are there is no crew, as it were. It's yeah. not like there's actually a film being made. Um, yeah. And I think about like comparing it to stuff like um, Drop Dead Gorgeous came out like mm. at a similar time, yeah, yeah, yeah. and also has mockumentary elements. But there is a crew. There like there are people who are making that yeah, film, and they, that. you yeah, can yeah. see them in reflections or oh, people yeah, told yeah. to turn off the camera, stuff like that. <laughs> Which is funny because again, Drop Dead Gorgeous is actually not a good document, good mockumentary in that sense because it it looks it's a great yeah. film. I love yeah, Drop no, Dead no, Gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it, it doesn't try to be a mockumentary, no. except when it suits it, I think. Which is almost the opposite to this, where the mockumentary thing just seems to be like another aspect of the fun that Baz Luhrmann yeah. is having. Just a poke, I think just a way, another way to poke fun at it, I guess, or make or suggest the heightened, yeah. you know, seriousness of that, how every character takes, you know, the dancing world, but it's actually, it, it's not, it's ludicrous, you know. But then also yeah. I was wondering, I did wonder, like, is it potentially part of, like, a news report or something, you know, that, you know, I was thinking maybe it's more like that. Again, this is just me overthinking it as a filmmaker where I was like yeah. trying to understand, it, doesn't, it didn't bother me, like, I love it anyway. And I think actually I really like the mix of styles. And I think also just breaking the fourth wall, you know, talking to the camera, yeah. those elements of stuff that I really enjoy as well. But I think just it sets... I think it's just a, another way of setting the tone. Um, <laughs> did I fail ever as a mother? You know, just, yes, yeah, it's, it's all great. I just love it. <laughs> well, I think there's there's an interesting bit um, pretty soon after that when it kind of cuts to the studio, the dance studio, like a couple yeah. of days later, and, yeah. and he's going to actually break up with his dancing partner who's been working yeah. with for ages. Um, and there's two things about it that are interesting. Because first of all, I think they kind of code the story to be like queer to, or to be read as queer to some extent. Okay. Because there's this whole extended section about like, I was forced into these flashy crowd pleasing steps, <laughs> even though she seems to be enjoying them when she's doing them. Mm, yeah. And then there's, she says, um, I'm not dancing with you until you're dancing like you're supposed to, which sets up okay, like, this, this kind of yeah, section. Yeah, yeah. But maybe more importantly, um, I think for Lerman, he says what he feels about filmmaking in that moment when um, Scott says back, the audience liked it. Yeah, the audience yeah. liked what I was doing. And uh, she says, the audience, what do they know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah. it's not it's not her it's uh, it's his dancing so it's, a Le it's yeah. les i think yeah, yeah les les is like the audience what do they know and i think that's the whole statement of the film is like <laughs> i'm just gonna do stuff that i really like that i have a jazzy time with yeah and funnily enough as well something that because in my head i think all of my remembrance of this film was dominated by that big brash style mm. and a couple of key scenes like the ending sequence is very good and, yeah, and, and you know the secret dance in front of the mirror and all that kind of stuff but um most of it was all in that style and then i was amazed to see that 
actually there's a large chunk of the film that doesn't have that style to it and it's basically yeah. whenever he leaves the dance studio and goes to see fran and her family who are these kind of immigrants living in near literally next to the railway tracks yeah yeah it, Suddenly feels much more grounded, and it's in, yeah. in quite subtle ways. Especially on considering, I don't think Lerman is a subtle filmmaker. You know, I don't think we could ever really call him that. No, um, they switched to like more naturalistic camera lengths, like lens yeah. lengths, um, and the edit becomes less showy. The camera stops moving so much, and there's more kind of naturalistic sound. So yeah, yeah, I was really interested to see that tension in the film as well because it seemed like Lerman almost saying, "Well, look, can't I have both?" You know, if the audience likes both of these things. Yeah, I think it's actually the. <laughs> experimental as a term is something that you know it, it depends it, it varies but you're right like the when I, the more i watch it I, the, sometimes you know there's elements of like slapstick you know in the in the opening sequence which i'm like sometimes i'm in yeah. the mood for sometimes i'm not if i'm honest like, even though i know the film i'm like uh that kind of changes the tone there and then literally the next breath it becomes more naturalistic again you know or um and it, it yeah it kind of it does all kind of work but also it is so tonally inconsistent a lot of the time, but at the same time, I don't judge it on that. I kind of embrace it all, but it, it does seem like that maybe perhaps there was a lot of experimentation where I do wonder if like, maybe they tried different things with certain um, scenes, you know, or did, did is that kind of an idea that he knew he was going to kind of jump between, you know, quite heightened reality or that a lot of people call it a fairy tale, which I actually think is a really way of um, looking at it. Yeah. And, I, and that, that's a nice way of thinking about it. Yeah. Which I hadn't heard until I was like reading up and other people kind of talking about it. And I went, actually that, that doesn't make a lot of sense now I've heard it, you know, um, cause you know, it's it, you know, on the surface, it feels real, but at the same time it's not. And then you can apply this, the simple story or even the themes and um, motivations to kind of anything, you know, it can, it's so, adaptable yeah. to society or even like microcosm like a dancing <laughs> uh, tournament or a competition so i was interested that you described it as being satire because yeah. i i don't see it as satire and I, I think the slapstick thing that you said is much more like how i interpret the film yeah um i think about like this there's a lot of focus on like people saying silly things so like yeah. the bogo pogo uh, uh, or okay, whatever this yeah. possibly <laughs> made up dance move is and no, I, also, think real, um, I think it's a real move but i did i did i did <laughs> really think God. it yeah i did think it was fake until i looked at it i was like oh actually is it, is it true i still don't know for sure but i I think it's real. <laughs> well, I know that Lerman did a lot of ballroom as a kid. Yeah, yeah. Um, So I think it, it, a lot of it is drawn from actual stuff. And then also there's a constant... Characters kind of chuck phrases to each other and they come up in yeah. later scenes. Yeah. And uh, there's a thing which is like one egg, one rotten egg spoils the barrel. Oh, which yeah. is like this misspeaking, <laughs> which is like quite... Just yeah. kind of like thrown in there. Um, <laughs> and yeah, like it is... I think... It, I've written here that it's kind of like broad, kitschy filmmaking as these big, yeah. sketchy characters. I saw someone describe it as cartoon uh, as well, which I think yeah, is interesting. That's interesting. And I think yeah. that, that that tension between different ways of shooting it, like more and mm. less realistic ways of doing it, I think was an original intent because um, the flashback, which kind of reveals his dad's backstory that happens later in the oh, film, yeah. was originally supposed to be shot in a much more grounded yeah. way. Yeah. They ran which out of money. Yeah. yeah. Which I thought was really interesting because I actually think it does work better the way it is. And I actually really yeah. admire the fact that, that whether that was because of budget or, you know, classic filmmaker, <laughs> he's got to shoot it this way, make it work. Um, yeah. But I actually think it, 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 plays well into the film i think it would have changed because you've got it's quite a serious moment i think but it's also like yeah. it's, or you know especially the, the lie that's being told um, um how you've got, <laughs> you've got to dance this way uh dance federation steps um otherwise you know it could all go wrong um but yeah the flashback is very tongue-in-cheek um but it's still like poignant at the same time you know like you you feel for doug you know and uh yeah, but you're laughing as well. <laughs> it goes back to what you're saying about there being like a heightened tone for it. Because yeah, I yeah. think weirdly that allows you to buy to buy that story as serious yeah. and as funny at the same time. 100%. Because yeah. it's like an opera, I guess, where it's mm. like they're, they're deliberately making it a heightened feel. And so true, it can yeah. have like a dual meaning. And I think likewise, like the love story with Fran, that's the interesting thing that struck me as I watched rewatching it is like that felt very underdeveloped to me. Where it sort of seems like it happens purely because that's what's expected. But that works better because the tone of it is so heightened already. Yeah. It seems to make more sense in that context. Yeah, I did notice actually. But in terms of obviously, you know, w- you know, will they, won't they, even though it's, you know, they will. Yes. Or, you yeah. know, but at the same time, they don't have a lot of ty- uh, moments where, you know, they embrace or kiss. I think they only like kiss twice, obviously at the end, yeah. you know. It's very chaste in that yeah. way. Yeah, so I yeah. think it is it is about the partnership and it's more like the, the central nature of the dancing, you know, and obviously that connection. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people, when I was reading, when I watched like clips, you know, from the film and a lot of comments on it from people, they're going like the chemistry that they have and just the way they look at each other, and but whether it's in, as they dance, or even in those close-ups, that's all you need. Like it does, even like, it, that's what I love about it as well, that, that you know, 
it is really raw, honest, and you know, just great performances. But um, but yeah, and yeah, they're really intense. But I, I love it. But that's all you need. You don't need them to kiss or to embrace more than that. It's told through the way they look at each other. And again, I think that's more like what he's riffing off this like dance yeah. theater where like yeah, sometimes exactly. there is no yeah. actual expression on stage of that kind of stuff. Mm. And it's probably a good time to talk about the acting as well. Um, I was like doing that thing of looking up these people and reading about Paul Mercurio, who is the lead actor in the film, mm. uh, who has like almost no other IMDb credits, which is quite yeah. one of those things. And it turns out he's actually, he was already quite a prominent dancer in yeah. like the Sydney ballet. I think Sydney or Melbourne, I'm not actually sure. I'm not sure. Um, he's actually a ballerina, I think, if I read it. Or something yeah, like, so he yeah. had to retrain completely. Yeah, I film. know. That was amazing. Um, I read that. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> And also, likewise, like Tara Maurice, who plays Fran, is not a dancer at all. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because I think she comes across quite strong on, on the film. Certainly, you can see he's the better dancer. He's more comfortable as a dancer, as a mover. But that makes sense for their characters for most of the runtime anyway. Um, I do love that they've tried their best to make Tara Maurice like, less stunning than she is. For the start of the film, they like painted pimples on her and given her glasses. And she sort of just magically gets better looking over the course of the film, just like... And there's no real explanation for it. Well, I, they, I think it's there, is, there was a little thing in the beginning where she was where um, she's got apricot scrub. Yeah, right? yeah. And they, yeah. There's, a few, there's a few moments where you like off screen, she it, she she ran out, and then obviously she's got some truth. Now she she's better or whatever. But obviously, it's also you know the idea of like the ugly duckling that becomes a beautiful swan. Where you know some people might you know in a twenty twenty one audience might go, Ugh. <laughs> but I, d- I don't know. I, I, again, I think it, it's a deliberate thing. It feels yeah, like it's part yeah. of that the premise of it that it would have yeah. that kind of storytelling in it. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't mind it. But I think, uh, I don't know, but I, I just go with it. I think that's the other thing with the film, you kind of just go go with it, yeah, and I and you you take it on the chin as what it is. And, but also, I think you do embrace it. I think I, she's also becoming more confident in herself um, yeah. as well, you know, and, you know, but it's also, but at the same time, it's not like she's she starts off as, well, it, it, she, she is quite a reserved character, but then I think, but she's still got a lot of, like, fire in the belly, like, kind of thing, like, yeah. you, you know, but I think she's just kind of, not sure how she's going with emotions, but I'm saying you, she still stands up. She's she's obviously doing her own steps, you know. She you know she's doing her own thing, but she just doesn't know how to like channel it. And then obviously then it's like awoken when she sees um, Scott dance his crowd pleasing, flashy steps, um, and then and just having and obviously they they make a big deal about you know a beginner can't talk to a, a professional, you know, but she does yeah. that anyway. So it shows yeah. that she's kind of a bit of a rebel like he is as well, you know. And um, so they are both compatible, and they're also both individuals and they just needed someone else to kind of the right partner um to bring that out of each other you know i think to me that's what makes her an interesting character because she could be quite easily like a passive character yeah but actually she's pretty active in fact i think she does more to make the plot happen than yeah scott does yeah um and interestingly there's a switch halfway through the film when he kind of goes back to her house meets her family who are um are they Spanish or are they Latin American? I'm actually not I, sure. Um, they dance the Paso Doble uh, and he, they all find his dance hysterical. Yeah. Uh, and it, so it teach him, him like yeah. a more authentic way of doing it. And then that becomes this journey of self-discovery where it's no longer about him teaching her, but more about yeah, her yeah. heritage teaching him. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's a nice way of flipping the script. Otherwise it would feel, I think, like she was quite a passive character yeah. and there was a lot about like her worth in relation to him. Yeah. yeah, and so yeah. It, it does kind of switch that around, which is a really interesting. Or just, and he's still, and I think there's still those elements where I was, I noticed as well, like, especially when he first talks to Fran, um, where obviously he's challenging the status quo, but then he kind of uses the rules in he, when he wants to, like when he's saying like about to Fran, um, she's gone from my head, but she's like, when she's actually asking him as a beginner and he's like, you know, you have no right to kind of talk to me. So it kind of when it's when it's good for him, um, but also also that when when they're about to do the past over, he's like, "Don't worry, just try and keep up." You know, like it's an arrogant <laughs> arsehole essentially. And you're like, oh. so it's kind of good that he's he needs to be kind of brought down a peg or two. So even though he's kind of finding himself and wanting to do his own way, but he's still got to kind of break through from the kind of um, federation way of doing it, which you know, which is probably its own microcosm. You know, essentially that's what they all know. They, it's kind of its own ecosystem you know where you you buy the vhs tapes you learn the steps you dance in these local competitions the way that we tell you to where, and i yeah. think there's something about like it's not even about him learning how to dance for himself it's about like finding an authentic tradition or something like that because he's even once he's started doing these flashy crowd pleasing steps the, the passion is from the heart but not the actual dance and i think it's about him finding a 
a way of communicating what he wants to through dance, uh, but in a dance language that already exists or within a, within a more authentic tradition. 100%. Because, yeah, because I think when Fran even says to him, like, you know, you're just overdoing it, <laughs> he is. Like, when you, even in the opening scene when he's, like, doing his own thing, you're like, he's just, and same with how Doug was doing it in the flashback, they're very just kind of like, I'm just going to do what I want, you know, which is a good way to kind of express yourself, but at the same time you still want to, you know, find the right direction or kind of, not hone it in, well, maybe hone it in a bit. Um, or like you said, finding an authentic outlet or way to kind of present how you're feeling. And um, yeah, which just basically love it. <laughs> and maybe that's why, that that's how we can interpret how Lerman feels about filmmaking mm. as well, to kind of draw it back to, to that kind of comparison. Because I think he finds a balance there in the end that's about doing his crazy thing, but also pleasing yeah. an audience, you know, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and kind of understanding what they want and being able to tell an actual story through that. Yeah. Yeah, Funnily yeah. enough, a, a balance, which I think he's lost. Uh, so I, I, in my head, I was like, oh yeah, Strictly Ballroom, back when Baz Luhrmann made good films, <laughs> um, which I think is maybe slightly unfair. I'm, I know that he hasn't made a film in about eight, nine years. He hasn't made a film since um, Great Gatsby. So actually, disclaimer, I realised recently that i'd never seen any of his other work it's always been really about, yeah and i only watched moulin rouge i watched it for the first time yesterday um i wow watched, yeah um because i went i was like i bet that comes up <laughs> and i went for some reason i just kind of watched strictly Boyle room i knew bazo i was like that was great then i need to never see anything else he had ever done again even though on paper every every other follow-up film that he had done i thought like, that sounds great it's kind of a similar um the premise sounds great and I say this to like I I and but I'm not sure if the execution is as strong. But then I think what kind of strictly ballroom is it's such a simple story in a way. But it's kind of then all the elements of um, the flashiness, you know, is the way it is the, the shooting style. But also it, the rawness of it. I kind of maybe that's just me as a filmmaker and a viewer. I just kind of prefer that. Whereas I think don't get me wrong. When I watch Miller Bridge, I still don't know how I feel about it. Like I've watched this is I tried to watch it twice. I watched it once, like maybe a few years ago. I got about ten minutes in and went, "I'm just not feeling this." Like I'm just, I think you have to be in the mood for it, yeah. And because it's a musical as well, like I think you have to be in the right. It's mood. not just a musical; it's a jukebox musical. Well, yeah, well, yeah, even rougher, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I think I watched about ten minutes and went, "I was surprised that I didn't like it at that point." If I'm honest, I was like, "Oh, that I was sat down to watch it. I was, you know, up for it, and uh, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm not really feeling this." I was like, I'll watch it again eventually. And then I didn't afraid you. Then I thought, well, actually, and then yesterday I went, well, maybe I should just in case that comes Got up. Done. Yeah. Yeah. And I, again, I was still like, I'm not sure how I feel about it. I can't decide if it's like a hot mess or like an inspired masterpiece. And I think it's a bit of both. Um, it's both. It's, it's both. both. It's tons yeah. of both. Um, I mean, it is ultimately, I think it's designed to be a hot mess. So it's kind of hard to say whether, what the real worth of it is in that context. But but also a lot of people said that, that they told me when they when they realised I hadn't seen it, they were like, oh my God, you'll love it. And it's amazing film. And uh, I hate when people say that because I'm like, oh, yeah. yeah. I, um, I'm always like, don't you tell me who to be. Yeah. <laughs> don't you yeah. tell me what I like. And uh, I was like, I'll be the judge of that. Um, and then... <laughs> And then, and also, but then when I tell people to watch Strictly Ballroom, I'm like, I, some people I showed it and they're like, yeah, it was all right. Or, uh, it's a bit dated and I hate, or I'm like, oh. I mean, it is it, absolutely it is. dated, yeah. but I, I would argue that like, oh, that should be your, is, the one thing you take away from it, you know? Like, yeah. Like, it's yeah. dated deliberately, um, yeah. from the off by them. Um, 100%, yeah. yeah. I mean, if, it, if it's, have you seen the other of his films? No, I've seen, I've seen bits of Romeo and Juliet, but I haven't watched it all the way through. Do you um, want the objectively true ranking of how good the films are? I, yeah, go for it. I'm pretty sure right, I let's probably go. agree with you without even seeing them. Yeah. But yeah, go All on. All right. Um, number one is Romeo and Juliet. Number okay. two is Strictly Ballroom. Number three is Moulin Rouge. Uh, then it's the Great, Great Gatsby. Gatsby, followed by Australia, somewhere down below. Oh, um, Australia, yeah. Australia kind of sucks. It sucks real bad. And it's um, it's not it's not good. It's bad. So That's apparently, what I've got I was, to say about it. Yeah. <laughs> apparently, uh, I was reading just trivia, um, which again, you, you never know how true it is. But then apparently for Moulin Rouge... Uh, Heath Ledger was, you know, down for the lead of that is a view McGregor, but then they decided yeah. he was too young for Nicole Kidman, and I was like, okay, um, possibly but, true, I think at that I time. Did, I'm, yeah, maybe, but even then, I was like, okay, that would have been an interesting pairing, I think, because I think even Heath Ledger as a person actor, he was definitely older than his years, I think. So I don't know if it would. I, I'd be intrigued mm. to see how that would have worked. But apparently, he had he was asked back for Australia. <laughs> he declined. He was like, he was he never forgave Baz Luhrmann for that. And I was like, damn. Great. I but then I, I haven't seen Australia yet, so I don't know how. But if you say it's not that, not many people seem to, you know, it doesn't even be like highly regarded in the general. I just don't think there's like enough underneath Australia. There's not enough under the hood, and even that's why I put Great Gatsby above it, which most people don't, because I think Gatsby ultimately like 
I remember, you know, Brett Easton Ellis, the writer of uh, American Psycho, he tweeted out about the film, um, every generation gets the Great Gatsby adaptation it deserves. Right. And I, I, think see. That, okay. I think whether or not Lerman intends it, there is a lot of subtext to his adaptation of Great Gatsby because of like, it, the conceit of making a Great Gatsby film, you know, because you, you're never going to make a film about how bad wealth is in a Hollywood budget period film setting. Do you know what I mean? So Yeah, and especially with Baz Luhrmann directing it as well, when it's going to be flashy and big budget and, yeah. Exactly. I feel like he just, he was just like, we in the movie, <laughs> which is like bad. Um, uh, he made a TV show as well um, yeah. called The Get Down, which was on Netflix and I didn't see. Um, no, he's made a number of theater things and also some opera stuff, I think since. Yeah. And then he's got a film about Elvis coming out. Um, yeah. It's supposed to come out during COVID and then it's now been pushed back. Uh, that's when Tom Hanks got, got COVID. So, cause he was doing the Elvis oh. movie in Australia. Oh, there you go. oh I see. I, I, I saw that, you know, but I haven't researched it. So um, again, I don't know. It's not that I, I don't think it's, I don't want to see it, but I think it's, or I, I don't know. I just, I think it's strictly boring. Just it kind of, it, it's exactly what I like. And then I've, for some reason, yeah. I just kind of go, and that's what I love about that film. I just love that film. But I've never been desperately keen to see other words. But I think I just judge it on the film as opposed to the director. Like, for sure, you're going to yeah. get threads, you know, of themes or stylistic approaches. But I think perhaps, you know, like, you know, the common, uh, you know, thought process, you know, where, you know, just because you've got a higher budget and more resources doesn't automatically make a better film, you know. And, yeah. um, and I think, obviously with Basil, you know, being, you know, quite flashy in general, even at the three million level and, you know, um, to then get, you know, God knows how much more, it's still always going to be there. But the fact that you've got all those resources at your disposal doesn't automatically make a better film. But then again, yeah. uh, going back to Moulin Rouge, like I, it's, it's something that I'm going to maybe, I don't know if I want to watch it again, to be honest, not for a while, but like it was, but at the same time, but there was a lot of things going for it that I did really like about it. When I, but at first I really, I was kind of just watching it. It wasn't until like halfway through where actually I was like, I started to kind of get the world a bit more and there's kind yeah. of elements of it. I was like, actually, this is kind of interesting. And the editing and some of the, some of the cinematography is great, like amazing. Yeah, I, it's has some beautiful production design as well, yeah. like some of the best yeah. ever, really, I think. Yeah, for sure. So there's a lot of things going for it. And I was like, okay, I can see where this kind of cross-cutting and all these kind of like themes blurring. I was like, okay, this is, okay, there is definitely stuff here that I'm kind of getting and enjoying, but overall... I was like, I'm not sure how I feel about it. And I'm, yeah, and I'm still not sure, but yeah. I wonder sometimes about how much of the like love for that by critics is because most film critics are like um, bitter theatre kids. Uh, Maybe. But Maybe. I don't, controversial. That's why Annette is going to get such good reviews. Um, <laughs> I also feel like it was linked to a specific kind of moment in 90s filmmaking as well. So yeah. when this film premiered at Cannes, it got 50 minutes applause and then mm. uh, it was sold for a million pounds in cash on that night. <laughs> Uh, which is a really, really <laughs> 90s story. Like, I don't think yeah, it yeah. was that kind of Miramax. I mean, it's Miramax bought the film. Yeah. It was that Miramax moment of like, we're going to grab up all these indies. Everyone wants to go see independent cinema. Yeah. No one cares about big movies anymore. Yeah. And it just isn't true anymore. And I feel like, unfortunately as well, the bigger budgets that, that Lerman's gotten, the worst his movies have gotten in part, because I don't think he's a glossy filmmaker. I think he's a tacky filmmaker. And that tacky, no, but that tacky no, no, is yeah, just yeah, deliberate. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the problem is, is that as he gets bigger and bigger in his ideas, it makes less and less sense for them to be tacky. Exactly. And so they just feel tacky as opposed to like being about tackiness. Yeah, you can't be and, tacky and, with and like a hundred million dollars, you know, whatever. yeah. 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 Well, you can, well, you can but then but it just <laughs> makes it a waste of the money yeah, as yeah. opposed to <laughs> doing something interesting with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so you'll, you'll see that when you watch the rest of films, but do give Romeo and Juliet a watch. I think it's a good adaptation. And it also, those three kind of red curtain movies are the most similar of all of us. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so with that in mind, you know, the, the last thing I always ask people to do on this is imagine that you're telling people about this film. You've never seen it. You don't know anything about it. If you had to pick one scene to recommend the film to an audience, what would it be and why? Um, hmm. there's two scenes that I think are my favourites, but also I'm not sure if they're the right. Mm. This is I, I should yeah. say this is it because it shouldn't be too spoilery as well, right? You got to imagine yeah, no, if I... you're like at a party and someone's like, "Wow, what's strictly boring?" You got to be like, "Okay, I've got two minutes of your attention to show you this on a phone." Um, I mean, don't ever no, do no, this, no. people. Yeah. People hate that shit. <laughs> I, I I hate that shit, and I love movies. Watch this whole scene that I really like. Yeah. And I'm gonna watch you like. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, Wait, just this is, I've got the whole of Zodiac on my phone. Am I just sitting down and watching David Fincher's <laughs> best film? It's only three hours long. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, right, so the t yeah, I, I think 
I will just say I won't give the ending away, but I think that the ending scene or just that whole sequence is amazing. And every time I watch it, you know, do you mean the? No, scene? no. When Scott re-enters, I think, and he kind of glides across the floor, and it's like that, yeah. that zoom in on um, oh, funny his name, uh, Barry Fife, uh, his red face of like. I just love that. That's, that. that's not my... Well, that's just a great scene, but I think that's an obvious choice, but I wouldn't say that. I think my favourite scene that I would recommend... I think it's the scene when he does the pasta dope. <laughs> what? What's so funny? Passo doble? <laughs> Passo doble? I think at that point she's been yeah she's been scared off so basically she's been scared off by his parents you know the whole federation where they realize that whether they think they're just a good pairing but it's also not the right pairing because he needs to be seen with tina sparkle um and uh because she's this amazing dancer and you know he needs to do the right steps he needs to be the right partner for the federation to continue essentially and to keep the status quo but then everyone's seen him dancing with fran it's really emotional and um just great and, and yeah, and intense. So they try and scare her off and then he goes to find her and then he meets her at her family's house, um, this little shop by the, the railway. Um, and then her dad kind of discovers Scott and, you know, thinks the worst, like, what's he doing here? Um, you know, leave. Um, but then they, I don't know how they get into conversation with Pastobly. He, he thinks that they were lying about dancing together. He thinks they were like oh, dating that was or something. Yeah, yeah. You think, yeah. So he he's like, well, show dating. me the Pastobly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and then um, the, the, the nan comes out um, and she's like, show, yeah, show, show us. And very, very, so for something that seems quite, is quite grounded, that whole, I love that, but it's also like very, theatre where they kind of like show yeah. me show me like and, and, and his dad no, just happens to be wearing like yeah, perfect yeah. dancing clothes no as well. especially like kind of a west side story where no disagreement would be solved by dancing you know but same time i go with it. um and then they anyway so they all come to the the back porch garden and uh fran and scott uh do the pastel and uh scott tells fran to keep up with him <laughs> but you can tell in her eyes she's like don't do it <laughs> Or um, I've got to go. Not their stance. Yeah, don't, yeah, not in front of these people. So they do it, and it's very um, just not great. Uh, I mean, it's probably a traditional federation pasadoble. That's the whole point, yeah. but it's not an authentic one. I think we're supposed to read it as like a sanitized, yeah. uh, like weak or like a yeah. non passionate version of the of a dance that should be none of those things. Yeah, yeah. It's someone who's taught it who's got no idea what a pasadoble is, but it's yeah. also better to a, a kind of general maybe Western audience. You know, where you're like, oh, okay, cool, that's great. Um, and then everyone starts laughing, and then uh, the dad—I forgot his name actually. Um, I can't remember. I've done one. Fran's dad. He—they're all laughing, and he's like, "That's not Pasadobly. I'll show you Pasadobly." And this is a spoon type thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you've got this guy, guy on the guitar. I love that music. I love the whole sequence about it. It's just a great. And then he's kind of very—I um, don't know—masculine. I don't. But it's also very. It's. I don't, yeah, it's just very authentic and it's great and you should see him and, he, and 
Scott is kind of like mesmerized by it. You know, it's just like something's awoken in him. And, you know, you've got these kind of zoom or tracks in, sorry. Uh, you've got close ups of the kind of the feet and the kind of tapping and the kind of finding the beat in the rhythm. Um, and he's just kind of mesmerized by it. And uh, yeah, just that whole sequence, uh, and they start clapping. Uh, I just think it just I what I love about it is just the, the kind of like the intensity coming from like these tracking shots and the close ups and um, and also like the lighting and just the feel, the feel of it. I think yeah, it's, it's, it's like whole... nighttime. They're barely yeah. lit on this kind of patio, and um, they a lot of the film, as you say, is very close. Yeah, but it tends to be largely like wide and close. It tends to be like on a wide lens pushing in. Yeah, which tends to make everything exaggerated. Yeah, this is this, what happens in this is like yeah, they're very zoomed shots, so they're very long focal lengths, yeah. or probably not even that long, just in comparison to the rest of what's yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's also it's also the most expensive scene in the film, which is why it's interesting that you chose it. Interesting, um, because a train passes oh, by yeah, yeah, yeah. halfway through, and so it's only in about three shots. This train, they had to hire the train to do that. Um, but it, it's a really important moment where he begins to feel this passion and he's kind of taught yeah. to do it from the heart as opposed to just straight from his yeah. feet. Yeah. And the camera kind of pans up from his feet right up to his face. And as it does that, you can see the train beginning to pass in the background yeah. as the music lifts up. And it's this really good bit of directing, I think. Sometimes it's hard to describe what a, what's the difference between like a capable director and a good director. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's one of the things that really marks Lerman out as a talent there, <laughs> as much as I don't like about half of his movies. I think that it the idea of saying, well, let's reflect that passion, that energy, that drive suddenly arriving and having a literal train engine like blast by in the background yeah. is such a big scale kind of like image, such a big yeah, idea. Yeah. Um, and it it's gorgeous. I, I totally agree. That's my favorite scene in the film as well. Um, I think the only comparison to it is the the first sequence where we see Scott kind of blow off the rest of the dance crew. Mm. And he's kind of explained to them why he doesn't want to learn the steps. It's not about oh, well, I'm sorry, I'll do it again. It's about like something in him has changed. Yeah. And he's on his own in the studio after after everyone else has left and he dances in front of this mirror. Mm. And it's this moment of kind of like reflection and passion from him and then Fran finds him there. Uh, yeah. And that's a nice, I mean, that's a really good kind of like um, story moment, but also a good bit of dance on screen. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, um, we actually get to see much complete dance in the film, which is funny because yeah. I, I remember it as that. Um, you get to see a lot of ballroom, um, no. which is not, you know, not really what you want to see. Um, but you don't actually get to see much complete dance till the end of the film. No, I, know, I mean, the way own, it makes it bigger, I guess. Yeah, exactly. But also, like the scene with that that the kind of precedes the the scene the um, with the family in the Paso Doble is obviously the scene where Fran and Scott dance um, at the local competition, and it's basically that that would be like my. I think those two are kind of I would say like fan favorite scenes for sure, but I think they are understandably so because I think that scene where you know she's basically doubting herself you know because then i could never do that and he's basically like no you can and we can and they're you know dancing behind the curtain it's just and you know with doris say perhaps 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 that song it just kind of it all it just it's so poignant and just but also the intensity i think that's where you see it in there and this the shot style is quite simple really it's just following them you know but you know you you, but it's also quite i'd say like mostly mid shots with you wise but you know their eyes yeah. never leave each other you know and again it's main, mainly from fran's perspective i'd say you know and i think that you know yeah just just that's at that point you're like she's like, she's amazing they're just and you i think you relate to her for sure like i definitely she's the, the probably the audience surrogate for the most part for sure like you definitely get, see it through her eyes um and i think that's why people love fran because you know i think everyone has that moment of doubt where you know I, i'll never be as good as that person or i can never achieve that and then they realize that they can or he helps her show that she can or they can together and they can do their own thing but anyway so those two scenes were the ones i've like i would have said but i think the past only one i think i that just kind of hits it a little bit yeah i think that's the one and, and i think it's also the thing that people remember when they talk about the film yeah, as well yeah. you know for all of that kind of artifice and kitsch i think yeah, it's interesting yeah. that the most naturalistic scene in the film is the one that actually wins out maybe because it's in the sea of yeah. everything else it feels so much more authentic exactly i think you're right it does stand out and i think that and actually all of those scenes with them rehearsing at um the house i think actually i did realize they're like even the, the one that follows with the, i don't know if it's the morning after or at least a few days after but um i realized how much i loved the way that shot you know, in terms of in, in the daytime when she's trying, they're fixing the dress and he's practicing and it's all just really warm and they, it's just really pleasant. But you're right, it's very natural. And, and you know, and it's kind of, it's he's finally escaped from the kind of high concept flashy world. It's, you know, quite a simple way of shooting. So it does, so maybe, maybe I, yeah, maybe there was a, there was a thought process to how to shoot those different, those two different worlds. But, but yeah, I, yeah, it's more naturalistic and you appreciate it more 
now that he's stepped away from that, you know, and um, but yeah. Sid, thank you so much for That's taking right. the time to talk to me about Strictly Ballroom. <laughs> Go watch it. I love that film. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, do you want to plug again your documentary that we were talking about earlier? Sure. On? Um, yeah. So uh, my feature documentary is called Microbs New Local. Uh, it's about uh, essentially it's about the microbe movement in the UK and the craft beer revolution um, following free people as they uh, open up their own micropubs and to revitalize their communities. And it's available uh, to rent stream on various platforms, including Vimeo, Plex, uh, Tubi, if you're in the States or Canada, um, and Plex, Filmsy, yeah, the various platforms, I'm sure Will can put a few down in the comments if you do decide to watch it. I'll pop them on the on screen in the YouTube version <laughs> of this. How's that? Like yeah, you can have awesome. logos all around your head. You want to do that? Yeah. There we go. That's <laughs> it. That's it. Professional. <laughs> Very good. Sid, thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for watching this video. To hear more of our conversation, check out the Indie Tricks podcast. Just search Indie Tricks wherever you listen to podcasts to get started.